So, good afternoon. Welcome to the first webinar in the Design for Learning series on instructional design. I'm Jessica Philippe from the South Central Regional Library Council, and I'd like to introduce today's speakers. So, we have Dr. Marilyn Arnone, an associate professor at Syracuse University's iSchool and the lead developer for the foundation module of the D4L program. And we have Arden Kirkland, who is the D4L project coordinator. And later in the hour, we'll hear from some program alumni, including Melissa Cornwell, Helen Linda, Amanda Calabresi, Anthony Bishop, and Scott Kushner. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And now I'll turn things over to Arden. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for getting us all set up for this and uh, everyone for coming today. I'm just going to switch over to share my screen with you all. Okay, so let me just check. Are you guys seeing my first slide there? Just a little yeah. title slide for the program? Great, thank you. So yes, um, let's just jump right in here. I'm just going to talk a little bit to introduce you all to the program for those of you who are really fresh to what we're doing with the Design for Learning program. So um, this is a big week for us. Not only are we starting, you know, launching this webinar series, but um, as of Monday, we've made the first two modules of our series available to the public for free and on demand at webjunction.org. Um, we'll be rolling out the rest over the next two months, and this webinar series will help to kind of introduce you to what we're, what we're covering with that. Now, for a little background, this program came together thanks to a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services as a collaboration between the South Central Regional Library Council, the Empire State Library Network, and the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University. Our first cohort began working September 2015. The second cohort began working February 2016. And they included participants from all over the country, all different types of libraries, subject specializations, and experience levels. And based on their feedback about the program, we've made it even better to share it on Web Junction. So some of them are here today to share their experiences with all of us. Um, so just to understand the program a little better, it's a series of seven modules, each one building on the last, to work towards developing a unit of online instruction for your own library, uh, which you get a chance to pilot during the capstone module. And the modules are designed to take about three to five hours a week, some take even less, um, over two to six weeks. Most of them are four, but we do have a mix of some short and some long. Um, and basically the orientation and capstone modules are kind of bookends to the real content areas that have been created by our course developers. So in this webinar series, we'll cover each of these, starting today with Dr. Marilyn Arnone and the foundation module. Now for our self-paced on-demand modules on Web Junction, we've added a few features. Um, each week's content is now organized in a lesson format which includes open reflection questions and multiple choice challenge questions for participants to gauge their progress as they go through. And uh, the reflection questions also carry over into our new D4L instructional design workbook. So there's space in the workbook for all of the reflection questions. Um, there's a chapter for each <coughs> module. And the, the workbooks are really designed to help you keep all your work together so that as you go through different parts of the program, you're collecting and working towards a final portfolio, again, related to your final capstone project. So the workbook is a place that you're, you're continuously revising your instructional design plan for your final capstone project. And this is what you'll, part of what you'll hear more about um, today, about this instructional design plan and that revision process and, and how some of our alumni have gone through that. So that's, that's my basic introduction. I'll put these links up here for a moment, but I'll also put these up at the very end um, just so you can, you can find us and follow up with us. Uh, but now we will move on to Dr. Marilyn Arnone. Um, she's been working incredibly hard on revising the foundation module for our new version. I'm so very grateful to her. So 
Um, Marilyn, thank you so much. I'm going to switch over to you and uh, let you tell us more about the foundation module. Thanks so much, Arden. Thank you. Can you see the slides now? I'm, I have to switch to you as presenter. Okay. And then you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Perfect. Very good. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Arden. Uh, thanks, Jessica, as well. Um, I'm really excited about this program, um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the foundation module because I'm more excited about what some of the alumni are going to say about their experience and what they're going to show us. So the foundation module is one of them that is six weeks long, so it's one of the one or two of the longer ones. And over the six weeks, we'll cover the instructional design process. We use a seven-step uh, process approach. It's based on uh, Diane Kovacs' model, which is also based on Gagné and some of the other famous instructional design theorists and researchers. Um, we will go through needs assessment and instructional goals, the instructional analysis, entry behavior and learner characteristics. We spend a lot of time on learning outcomes, and then in week four, learning assessments, because that is one of the areas where there's the most problem in actually matching good assessments with the learning outcomes and on the right level of learning. Um, so you can see on the screen some of the steps that we'll go through. I'd like to um, <clears throat> excuse me, mention where the emphasis is and the additional topics that we'll be talking about in this um, six-week module. As I said, learning outcomes and assessment, we put a lot of emphasis on that one whole week just for assessment, which is excellent, and strategies that you can use for formative and summative assessments. Bloom's revised taxonomy gives us a lot of help when we're designing those learning outcomes, and then again when we're designing assessments. So we'll be talking about uh, the taxonomy there. We also talk about the critical importance of learner motivation in terms of gaining and sustaining an audience, creating relevance for the content, building uh, confidence, and then maintaining confidence, and finally uh, creating satisfaction in the learning process. And what's great is that we're covering this for school libraries, public libraries, academic libraries, special libraries, and so you'll be able to plug into what is your biggest need in terms of some of the examples that will be given. And also we, in this module, and talk about it in later modules as well, that the introduction to the universal design for learning, how to make your learning accessible to all learners. And what I want to say also is it's not just lectures. We have built into these modules places for reflection on things that we might have talked about during the lectures. Um, we have challenge questions sprinkled throughout the modules. We've got places for creation exercises and practice. And finally, it is the products of learning that are going to be in each module so important to that final um, capstone module that you'll be doing. So everything is really practically oriented toward um, something that you're going to find useful and meaningful to you as the end product of all of this. So with that in mind, these products of learning, I'm going to hand it back to you, Arden, because that's what I'm most excited about is hearing from the alumni in the project. So hopefully I gave you a little bit of idea um, of an idea of what the foundation module will cover. Great. Thank you so much, Marilyn. We're going to switch over now and give our alumni a chance to talk. So we're going to start with uh, Melissa Cornwell, who's the distance learning librarian at Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Melissa and let you share your screen. And then we'll, we'll let you tell us about your project that you did throughout the Design for Learning program. All right. Thank you, Arden. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, great. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, so like Arden said, I'm Melissa. I work as the distance learning librarian at Norwich University, which is a military college in Northfield, Vermont. Um, I am the liaison to the entirely online College of Graduate and Continuing Studies. So the D4L program was perfect for me. And uh, my project would later become the, I call it the Savvy Researcher Workshop. Um, so my goals for this project were to plan, develop, and create, you know, an asynchronous six-module intensive research workshop to be completed before the students get into their first seminar. Uh, the way that the classes are given at Norwich is that they are entirely asynchronous, which means I don't meet with the students at all. And they're very, uh, they go very fast. So we have um, 11 in eight-week seminars for our students, depending on the population. We have both graduate and degree completion. Um, so it was kind of difficult. and. Uh, but students needed to learn a lot of things before they even got into the classroom, so how to conduct scholarly research, uh, successful research strategies for how to find sources for their classes, uh, how to evaluate those sources once they find them, and citing sources, which has always been a big problem for them, and then how to create and read proper citations. Uh, I wanted to get all of this in before they even get into their classrooms. Uh, they take a six-week orientation, so I thought, uh, piggybacking my research workshop off the orientation would be a good way to go. And I also wanted students to feel more confident about starting their coursework. They go in feeling very nervous. It's entirely online. They never meet with their instructors face-to-face, -face, so I wanted them to feel more confident before getting into their coursework. And then how this project evolved. So uh, the diversity module, for instance, was especially helpful with revising my needs assessment. It made me think about different uh, aspects of my, of my population of learners that I hadn't previously thought of, especially with the universal design for learning principles. And then the community module, um, I was toying with the idea of including discussions first, and then um, I was like, you know, maybe not, maybe I should. But the community module really solidified that for me. Uh, and I, w I realized that the, the sense of community was really what I wanted to include in this. I wanted them to feel connected to Norwich and to build their confidence. And then the social module um, helped me realize the need to talk about tools to help students fulfill their learning needs. So I did a whole other module into my instructional design plan for my workshop because of the social and community modules. And then the current status, um, I have a pilot launching in July for my project, and this is screenshot, it's just the start of what I've been building in Moodle at uh, my university. And that's kind of where I'm at now. That looks great, Melissa. I'm so excited to see how it's moving forward. I, I you know, I enjoyed so much seeing it work through the, the you know, pilot process and, and to see it really moving forward to students is so exciting. It is. I'm really excited. <laughs> well, thanks so much for sharing that. We'll have an opportunity for, um, we'll do some Q&A at the end that if anyone has some, some questions specifically for Melissa about her project or any of the other projects that we're going to hear about, you guys can, can post your questions um, in the question panel and we'll, we'll answer those at the end. So now we will move on to uh, Helen Linda. So I'm going to switch presenters to Helen. And Helen, you can get your screen lined up. Now, Helen is a records analyst at the Vermont Agency of Transportation in Montpelier, Vermont, and she's going to present some of the project that she worked on with us. Great. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Terrific. <laughs> there we go. Good, good. Okay. So, uh, uh, like Arden said, my name is Helen Linda. I am a records analyst for the State of Vermont Agency of Transportation, but when I started in the this program, I was a librarian at a small liberal arts college in Vermont, but because, uh, you know, records, records analysis is library adjacent work, and because a big part of my initial work at the agency was going to be revamping uh, education pieces, it seemed like a perfect opportunity to uh, take an actual, an actual piece that we were on a timeline for and uh, build it from scratch using actual instructional design instead of just my instincts, <laughs> which was, which is really what I was looking for. And uh, so basically what you had as of February 2016 when I started the program and was going through the orientation module was a 
uh, this was a uh, this these are just screenshots of the previous training, which was all uh, text on slides. Uh, it was static power uh, voiceover. PowerPoint that didn't read directly off the slides, but there was a lot of text and then there was a script. And uh, this was the first thing that was presented within the you know first two weeks that I was working at the agency. And it was presented to our oversight board and they were um, less than enthusiastic about how they thought this was going to be received. And so I saw that as an opportunity to uh, sort of snatch this up as my project for D4L and just take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, so I was going through orientation through February and I had to make a case for the change. Uh, this basically represents uh, where my thinking was having started going through the orientation module. So I hadn't even gotten to foundation yet, but what I was already learning from orientation was to focus on learners, to make, to chunk things properly, to um, uh, focus on short pieces and to be able to tie them together so they seem like they were, you know, part of the same family of learning. And uh, and basically this got, I, I presented this and made the case and then I drafted some slides. Again, this is before I even made it to foundation, but based on orientation, uh, we had images uh, they made their way in, and uh, we had less text, although at this point I had not quite yet learned to stop putting so much text on my slides for uh, this kind, the kind of training that we were going to be doing. And, uh, and basically, they, our oversight board for records and information management, approved this, and and uh, they had their own feedback about the about the product, and I got to start from here in the foundation module, building my instructional design plan along with the second draft of this new model. So it sort of flowed perfectly in time. But also, it's worth noting that uh, while you know, for for from my perspective, this is a this is a better version of what we had. This is probably the limit of where my imagination was going to take me and where my instinct was going to take me. And so uh, being able to go through this program and build an instructional design plan and really focus on outcomes and learners really moved this into a much, much better place. So, um, so we had, I, I understood prior to the foundation module that I needed to have uh, a focus on objectives and all that, but once I got approval to uh, follow the new path, what the instructional design planning process allowed me to do was focus on, first on learners, then on the sort of existing materials that I had that could make uh, building this less work and, and shorter for me, and then flesh out the outline of the training as a whole, which is what you're looking at here. This was, this is what we ended up with as a uh, a sort of flow. And uh, this diagram was a really good exercise for me early on. It forced me to ask questions about why we were doing what we were doing and how to chunk it, what was logical. And uh, the learning outcomes and motivation helped keep the focus on them and not on us. So it was tempting to keep looping back around to what do we, the records management department, want the learners to learn as opposed to what do they need to learn. And uh, it made developing materials easier because it was all mapped out. And the evaluation piece is the piece we still struggle with. It uh, continues to be a struggle in terms of you know, what do we really want to know so that we can ask the right questions? But we're getting there. And these just represent further iterations. The first, uh, the first image of our definition of our, the very, very first uh, version that when I got hired, uh, we were running with was just text on a slide. Then we had images and a lot more text. The first image that you're seeing here is what we went with in pilot. And uh, basically what the pilot really allowed me to do was take 
uh, wh take what I learned with my instructional design plan and then also take the needs of our learners uh, as they were going through it and combine them. And the piece that, uh, the last piece that you're seeing there is even more stripped down. And that's basically what we learned by being able to pilot it first before we went to live. And what we ended up with was, uh, for, the, for our deployment period, it ended up being uh, 21 minutes of content over three units, which was down from 48 minutes of one unit. And we ended that delivery period with a 98.5% completion, which is nearly unheard of. So it was a pretty big success for the agency. And uh, really what I learned out of all of this was <laughs> the simplifying is the key piece. Uh, I I've challenged myself to go as concise as I could and then make my force myself to try and go another round simpler um, and mainly that's because sometimes sometimes things can't be simplified the uh, concept is too big it's too complicated and so if you can simplify everything around that big concept then it it sort of helps the learners know where to focus their energy and uh, so the focus on the learners piece we I, I keep the, having the instructional design plan really gives you the opportunity to mark out those learners, but keep going back to it. And the key learning point for us was that, uh, you know, I made three units that were very short because, you know, the trend right now is in micro learning. And so uh, we tried to make a lot of really short uh, pieces that people could do in, you know, over a break. And it turns out that our learners prefer, if they're, if they're being uh, voluntold that they're doing a training, they want to just get it all done all at once. And so these were not designed to be viewed back to back, but that's how they were viewed. So we got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of comments about repetition. And so when we do this again, we will probably just uh, condense it back into one, but it'll be only 15 minutes. And that's, that's really taking what you learn from your learners and putting them first uh, and sort of compromising. And then the last piece was providing lots of access. The uh, universal design for learning challenges us all to uh, have a plus one way of thinking. And so every time I create something, I want to think, is there one more way I can provide access to it? And that way I'm sort of guaranteed a, l a little bit more success around completion. And uh, that's basically it for me. Great, Helen. Thank you. A again, seeing, you know, seeing how it's going through the whole process and, you know, how it's been received, you know, your, your 98.5 <laughs> completion rate is definitely impressive. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. <laughs> yeah, Very good. All right. So again, we'll, we'll come back to more questions with you after everybody presents. And now I'm going to switch. Next, we're going to have Amanda. So let me go back to change over here. So we have um, Amanda Cal Calabrese, Calabrese, I've never asked you how to pronounce it, Calabrese, uh, is the online instruction and electronic resources librarian at SUNY Delhi, and she's going to tell us about her project. So Hi, everybody. Amanda. As Arden said, my name is Amanda. Um, I work at SUNY Delhi, which is one of the colleges of technology in the SUNY system. Um, I was part of cohort one in the D4L program, uh, so I went through the earliest iteration of these modules as I worked on my capstone project. Um, so some of my terminology, some of my names for some of the modules have changed. Um, I'll try to keep track and map them to what they look like now. Um, so my project is a training course for faculty um, to encourage better design of research assignments or any assignment that incorporates information literacy skills. Uh, I'm calling it LibRAD or Library Research Assignment Design. Uh, so the librarians at SUNY Delhi had been seeing a lot of students asking for reference help with assignments that had requirements that were impossible or impractical for the resources that we have in our library. Uh, and I know from talking to other academic librarians that we are not the only ones with this kind of issue. Um, so we had been talking about how to address this with training or workshops. So the D4L program was a great opportunity for me to develop this idea. 
Um, so from the seven-step instructional design module model that we learned, um, I got a really good outline of what I wanted to cover and what my learning outcomes would be. Um, so I ended up breaking my content into sort of four units. Um, there were several outcomes under each of these, but um, I split it up so that there would be uh, a, a unit for available library resources, what do we have in our collection, um, an overview of information literacy, what do we mean when we use that term, information literacy. A lot of faculty think they know what that is, but we're not always talking about the same thing. Um, assignment design considerations, um, best practices in uh, writing an assignment description or a rubric. And then my last unit there, partnering with the library for student success, um, is basically other library services that faculty can direct students toward. Um, so I am planning to deliver this training in our campus's Moodle. Um, here's a shot of the home screen in the course. So you can see that that basic structure that I came up with in my first iteration of my instructional design plan still exists here with these, these four numbered units in the middle here. Um, so those are my four main units, and to that I added this unit zero is getting to know you um, based on what I learned in the social and community modules. It's just a, um, there's no content in there. It's just an informal social space to get the participants talking to one another, um, to build that learning community. And then um, I just added another section to be able to put my final evaluations and assessment things um, to keep those on their own. So, as I said, the foundation module, I think, is maybe going to be called instructional design, um, gave me a real, set me up with a really solid outline to work from, and the subsequent modules helped me to add different ways to present the content or different activities to engage my participants. Um, so I pilot tested just one of the four units. It was the this unit two, the information literacy one, um, and that unit included a discussion which followed a snowball format. Um, so instead of just having a threaded discussion forum where you throw out some questions for everybody to answer, you pair people up. They start in pairs and then they join up to form bigger and bigger groups as you advance the discussion and ask different discussion questions um, until finally everybody is all together. Um, and that was an idea I got in the community module. Um, I also added an exercise in Google Drive um, where participants will give feedback on each other's assignment descriptions and rubrics using the margin comments. Um, and that was based on um, some of the things we did in the social module, talking about social media and other online tools that you can use for instruction and building community. Um, as a couple of other people have mentioned here, there's a lot of emphasis in the instructional design process on knowing your audience and what's going to motivate them and what's appropriate for your audience. Since my audience is faculty, um, using Google Drive seemed like a better fit. A lot of them use this as a collaboration tool already. Um, it seemed like a better fit than asking them to have a discussion in Twitter or something like that. So uh, in general, I would say this process has been extremely valuable to me. Um, on our campus, this kind of online faculty training is usually offered by our instructional designers. Uh, and when I approached them about the library doing this training, the plan that I had developed through this program, I think, really helped them to take me seriously. And they were very accommodating about giving me space in Moodle to set this up. Um, so I, I had hoped to deliver it for real this in June coming up. Um, there's some schedule issues with the larger campus that have gotten in the way that I can't do anything about, so I'm hoping to try again in October. And that's it for me. Thanks so much for sharing this, Amanda. It's great to see. Yes, the, the things with scheduling definitely can get in the way, but it's it's obviously still moving forward, so that's great. Great to see. And, and I've, I've written down some of my own questions that when we come back to at the end, I'm, I'm excited to, to, you know, all of you to pick your brain some more about what you've done. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but next up, we have Anthony Bishop. So I'm going to switch presenters now to Anthony. And so Anthony, if you can um, 
share your screen. Great. Yep, so we're seeing your whole screen there. Good. So okay. Anthony is um, assistant professor and instructional design librarian at Borough of Manhattan Community College, uh, part of the City University of New York. So take it away, Anthony. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, so my capstone project, well, uh, first off, I'm a uh, member of the second cohort, and um, when I was completing this project, I was at Syracuse, and I had just recently switched jobs uh, where I'm at currently um, as of January. So I decided to just kind of walk you, you guys through my design plan um, as opposed to showing some of the slides that were from the um, original project because it was from another place. And so, so what my project focused on was the difference between scholarly and non scholarly publications. Um, the needs assessment came about in um, just reviewing and analyzing data that showed that, you know, students really were not a, um, equipped or knowledge um, with knowing the difference between and what the benefit of a scholarly source versus a non-scholarly source. So, you know, as far as what you can benefit from a newspaper source versus uh, what you can benefit from a scholarly journal or a um, article from a scholarly journal. And so I, so this first started with that. Um, as I began to kind of proceed and get into the program, um, I started to develop and enhance different ideas um, that really came about from participating in the various modules that we had to participate in. Um, so the you know first thing I, I really wanted to enlighten or you know bring to my learners were the uh, fact that you know what you know what one can get from a non scholar a non scholarly source which means you know you, you can find current data from a newspaper. Um, so if you if you wanted a a current topic or take a current event, then you can use a newspaper source to, you know, kind of provide that current background for it. But if but then to provide support and to reinforce that, um, you would want to go with a more scholarly source to enhance it and provide more in depth data behind it. Now, um, I'm going to do more talking than kind of walking through because I, I do want to share kind of what some of the things that I've done in my current role here at BMCC. Um, in particular, um, show you this page here, which, you know, just kind of this flow chart that kind of shows from the, from the um, learning outcomes to the, um, the actual conducting of the session. So, what, so two of the modules that really stood out to me were the foundational modules um, and the social modules. So uh, it has an instructional designer here. Um, I, I've been very pleasantly surprised with the teaching faculty here has been very um, embraceive of me and embedding me into a couple of courses here. So I've, I currently with a business marketing class um, and a black male studies uh, class, I have actually taken some of my project, which was um, enhancing and building an online learning community, and I put it in place with these, uh, with those two courses here. Um, for the male studies course, we um, did two projects that um, that the teaching faculty member actually let me create and put in place. So one was we um, used Instagram to, um, they were reading James Baldwin's Fire Next Time. And so they had to use that social media platform to actually create a, um, um, to provide weekly um, learning tool as far as either videos, PDF documents, and post them to this to this format with the um, hashtag for the for the course that we had the students actually create, and then they had to reply to two posts that were done by their fellow classmates, and then their final project, which will be 
um, put in place in two weeks. We are using a Pinterest uh, where they have to create infographics which will describe in a one-page um, infograph what they learned for the semester. And so that was for that class. In the um, business marketing class, we um, used a database called eMarketer, and we um, created another social media platform where we had students post updates on a particular company. So we uh, gave each student a particular company to track how they marketed or how they use social media to market um, towards consumers, and they they had to post different uh, facts or you know fast facts or reports weekly, and so their uh, final exam part of their final exam is to look at a a uh, company and evaluate uh, what in terms of marketing and using social media marketing um, either through mobile, web or um, a video, you know, which, um, what is the highest revenue and in terms of what they spend on social media marketing that this company has done. So all of this came out of my, you know, training in this program and it's gone over very well. I'm very excited to add that um, in the fall I will be uh, teaching uh, with uh, I have a master's in English composition, and so I'll be teaching uh, two freshman comp courses. And you know, because of the tenure requirement, I have to publish and conduct conduct research. And so, um, two of my projects that I'll be personally doing, which was sparked from this actual program, is where I would you know be teaching a course and and, and um, embedding some of the research components that we in our profession kind of see our uh, students don't really get from the freshman writing courses. And so I'm going to use these classes as a test module to, you know, see when there is um, a marriage between including academic research skills with the, with the writing skills neutrally, um, what will that do for the overall student performance and so I've gotten approval from the powers that be to actually track the students from the courses that they would take with me and you know um, as they continue on throughout their college career here to just see what type of grades and you know how well um, this would improve their writing and research skills so in a short that's you know that's kind of what I'm doing currently uh, which spawned from this project here um, that I did for my capstone project. That's so exciting to hear about Anthony. I really, I can't wait to, to hear more about, you know, as that, as that research develops. It's yes, going to be really and, interesting and, to see and I all. really wish I could have shown more, but, you know, this is just, you know, kind of in the starting phases, so oh, I had sure. to know more, you know, more talking through than, than, than actually showing, but I'm definitely looking forward to, you know, share with the group, you know, as things kind of get going, you know, how how this all develops and turns out. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Well, our, our last alumni presenter, we have Scott Kushner. So let me switch over to you, Scott. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hooray. We have audio. Okay, so I've just made you a presenter, so hopefully you can share your screen. So Scott is director of the Lafayette Public Library, which is part of the Onondaga County Public Library System in Central New York. And he's going to share some of his capstone project with us. So there you go ahead, Scott. Thank you. Okay. Um, First of all, I'm, I'm very happy that my mic's working. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, as uh, as you were just told, I my name is Scott Kushner. I am the a library director in one of the uh, uh, rural libraries in uh, Syracuse area, uh, Lafayette Public Library. Um, I was also an adjunct at Bryan and Stratton College, um, teaching uh, information. Uh, introduction to Information Literacy, which is what I did my 
capstone project on. Right now, I am not um, teaching, um, and so I have really have not had an opportunity to, you know, put any of this to the test. So my presentation is going to be kind of brief. Uh, I was just going to describe to you, um, you know, uh, what you see on the screen right now is my uh, instructional design plan. Um, and I, I, I found it kind of um, interesting that um, the challenge would, would have been to, uh, of course, transfer what I was doing face-to-face -to, -face to the online platform. And um, I found that a lot of the things that I was already doing uh, applied. Uh, for example, I, and, and this is what I have up on the screen here, uh, this is uh, some of the prerequisites that the students um, uh, would have to have before they could, um, you know, t uh, take this course. Um, and this is in the face-to-face -face as well as the um, an online uh, situation. Um, and, of course, the first thing you'd have to find out is how they can access what kind of technology they're using, like we had to do for this course, for the Design for Learning course, um, what's their operating system and so forth. But then the next thing that I do is is find out what their basic skills are using a computer. When I first started teaching, uh, that was in 2009, I had this somewhat not somewhat, an erroneous assumption that people knew how to use technology, that they knew how to use word programs, that they knew how to do attachments, most importantly. Um, and a lot of how uh, in face-to-face -face and in this situation, they would have to submit, um, uh, be able to do attachments and be able to know how to open up a Word document and save it. And, you know, these are things, uh, you know, maybe uh, in other, you know, a lot of you are academic, uh, in an academic institution, maybe a lot of the students you came across didn't have that, that issue. But anyway, so um, what I did, this was kind of one of the cool things about uh, this, this course was to learn, you know, to, uh, uh, learn about all these new toys. <laughs> um, so, for example, one of the things I did um, was I'm going to just bring this up here for a second. Uh, this is a. Uh, can you see the screencast? This is a. Yeah. This is a, this is a yes. screen. Yes. Great. And I and I did it on uh, uh, screencast o um, Very easy product to use. Um, and it's based on a Word document. Now, when I presented it within the uh, within our class, I think it was Helen actually that suggested, like, why don't you actually open up an email and do all this instead of showing a document? Which <laughs> which is true. I mean, I think in a, in a uh, if I was in creating the class, um, but what I did here was this is uh, I'm just going to play a little bit of it. Uh, it's based on the document that I created, which I would also send to the students, and then it just, um, hi, uh, this is Scott Christian, um, and the first thing that we need to do for this part is to be able to open a work document, save it, and then be able to send it as an attachment. Because every so okay, um, you get the idea. I'm not going to have you sit through this whole thing, but I was I you know the way it, it just you know click here, do this, do that. Um, what, one one of the issues uh, which I think Helen also pointed out to me at the time was that you know uh, I was assuming that pe people would be using Outlook, which in this case at Brian Stratton College, that's what they were using, and that's what the students would be using. So if I was going through that, you know, uh, the course would be there. Um, that's what it would be. So um, that was one of the things. Um, you know, was uh, was would be helpful to um, transfer this from from uh, face to face to um, online, and then you know. Uh, 
The other thing that was really helpful for me was with this instructional design was, again, having, I think a couple people mentioned this, was having to organize, uh, really, really organize what the outcomes are going to be for the learners, what you could use to motivate them. Um, and, you know, I basically drew from uh, the syllabus I was already using about what, what the goals were and what the learning outcomes should be. Mm. Um, and then, um, you know, and to, and to motivate them, I, uh, and this is what I would do with the regular classes, is try and really relate it to their lives, uh, to find any way I possibly could to say, this is how this is going to impact you. That it's not just for this course, it's if you're, presumably you're, you're here to learn some skills that you're going to be able to use later. Um, so, um, so that's kind of it. This is, I'm just scrolling through my uh, um, instructional design, um, and let's see. So um, the other thing I would use would be uh, um, PowerPoint, like for example, um, since this, this is a step-by-step -step, uh, course in um, information literacy, and this is the hierarchy that they would have to go through. So I would uh, make this available and, um, you know, have them, have them, uh, and this, this actually was one of the more difficult things to get through uh, in teaching the course. So I, I, I can't wait to be able to apply this to something because I'd really like to see how effective it would be in a not face-to-face -face and, and an asynchronous situation. So, um, so that's basically, I just want to show you a couple things that I, you know, I gathered from this course and, you know, and to emphasize how helpful uh, the, um, doing the instructional plan was and will be. <laughs> and that's about it. Thank you, Scott. That's, it's really great to see you know, how, how you worked through that process and to hear how it was helpful to you and it's, it's yes. wonderful to hear, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I can't, I'm not relating it to anything in particular right now, but I hope to be using it um, also uh, in, um, I participate in a lot of do, doing trainings in our library system, so I think that that could be, this could be a valuable tool for that as well. Absolutely, and I, I think it's a really great example of how, you know, we, we, I think of our presenters today, we've got a real range of different kinds of projects, different kinds of libraries, and different, different levels of how you're able to actually jump into that actual project or not, because in, in some cases people are able to, in some cases not, and it still, I think, is, is very valuable to go, to, to try to apply it to a real project, to go through the process you know, so that you're really thinking very actively about how it's going to work, whether or not that's that's going to immediately pan out into a real, you know, a real unit. So, great. Well, I think this is a good time for us to to move it to some Q&A. So if I can ask all our presenters to turn on your webcams. And uh, let's see. And maybe, I guess, Scott, I think you'll have to stop sharing your screen. Oh. Sorry. Uh, That's okay. Yeah. Okay, so there I am too. Yeah, because I think... Did I shot stop? Wait. We may run into the... Oh, there we go. There okay. we go. Yeah, because I think <laughs> it will fit more of us on screen here. So we yeah, want to... to get to my... I'm trying to open up my web, <laughs> webcam sure. now, so... Okay. Yeah, so, so again, for those of you that, that are new to this program, part of the, we wanted to kind of go to this webcam format at the end because this is how we often conducted, um, we, we had optional um, synchronous, you know, live meetups uh, for each of the modules. And this was the kind of format we would do that we'd, you know, whoever could meet at a particular time, we'd come together in a different video chat. We tried a lot of different kind of video chat tools and um, we'd all, you know, be on screen like this so we could see each other's smiling faces and, and talk and get so to know it, each other, et cetera. <laughs> like, this is so like it just, yeah, so it just told me that the webcam space was 
taken so you guys don't want to see my face, I guess. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, like, I guess fun. it maxes out at six then. All right, well, here, you know what? I'm going to take myself away gonna, then. I was going to yeah, do the same thing. I was thing. just trying to get in and say that. I was like, well, I guess nobody wants to see me, so no. I feel. You want to see me? <laughs> okay, so I'm so I'm out. So you you go in, and I'm gonna. Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying I'll, to open it up now. I'll be the voice as moderator, and then let's see. Okay. Webcam. So then I'm opening up our um, questions panel, and so for those of so for attendees, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the questions panel. And Jessica, if you have any other advice about that, feel free to chime in and let me know. Sure. Um, we did have one question earlier from Kathy for Melissa. So if you want to jump right into questions, she was asking, yeah. Melissa, is there a way for the general public to view your training? Hi, uh, no, not yet. Yeah, I designed it specifically for um, um, for my students. However, I am happy to share my content if I can post the link in here. I actually put all of my content on a guide if you're interested in that. Um, Absolutely, that sounds great. Right. So I kind of in LibGuides, um, I let's hope I can. Um, so my, sorry, my chat options are not, I hope everyone can see this if I put it in the, yeah. The, um, so uh, I put all my content on there to kind of give it an outline because I found it was easier to organize it before putting it in the classroom. So um, that's, that is the basic bones. The only thing that's different is how it looks in Moodle. So. Great. Can, can everybody see that? I'm not sure if that link in the chat no, just went to I just sent oh, it out to everybody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Okay, so I think that my camera is some so Arden, who can um, show us your face again? Because oh, okay. I'm having Very some difficulty. Cool. So no. I'll just okay. be here in proxy speaking, but not okay. not being seen. <laughs> We'll have you by, by voice, and I'll, I'll put my yes. face up. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. It's like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> yes, that's yes. what I love about yes, this. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's just cool. And everybody. Yeah. So, Kathy said, thank you, Melissa. And then Jean was asking, for Helen, what is the, the plus one way of thinking? Okay, so that will uh, that will be part of what gets covered in the foundation module. But in a nutshell, uh, one of the foundational ideas of uh, universal design for learning is that you, whenever you create content, you want to create an additional plus one way to access that content. So if you're making if you're making a video also make a transcript. If you're making slides, uh, also make a video or something like, so uh, always thinking, uh, I've made something, how can I make it accessible in at least one more way? Great, thank you. Are there any other questions out there? Well, I will, I'll jump in and, and pose one while we wait for more questions from our attendees. Um, I wanted to ask, what was, what was the biggest surprise, you guys, as, as you went through the different modules? Um, but was there anything that you were like, oh, I, I hadn't thought of that. I really should do X. And, you know, that really kind of came out of your experience as you went through. Can I uh, start first, guys, or you yes. or ladies first? Okay. Um, I can definitely say the social module, the online community building piece for me was um, – it's, it's funny how, you know, because, you know, because we know these things and we always hear about, you know, oh, you know, it's so great to, like, build an online community and da da, da. But when I actually – incorporated in the design plan which um, when I first sent it 
Arden was very strict and stern and said, oh, no, you need to add this, this, this. I'm like, okay. So I had to go <laughs> back and revise it a couple of times. <laughs> but but um, I, I can honestly say, um, as I shared during my, you know, five minutes that um, we, when I've done and incorporated here um, at my present job, it's been, it's been such a great response from the learners. You know, the uh, students really, the social learning theory and module being, it, it just seems to really get to our current learners, you know, to the, the way the modern learner just kind of digest data it seems to like really go well when you can reach them at their space and so like both of the projects that I shared that I am currently um, involved in here now have gone over tremendously well and so I was pleasantly surprised and glad that I had to kind of revise and you know kind of enhance that module and it it just really just in real time and real practice it has really led to a great outcome. Great. That's great to hear. Anybody else have surprises? Uh, when I uh submitted my uh, proposal to uh, the College of Graduate and Continuing Studies here at Norwich. I also gave them my instructional design plan and I could tell they were just overwhelmed, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, they were just, they're like, I can't believe, they don't even do that really with some of their own instruction. So to show them this huge plan that they, they were kind of um, surprised and I also, it definitely made it easier. Like Amanda said earlier, it made it a lot easier to uh, present my case. So. Yeah, definitely include the instructional design plan whenever you can. Yeah, I think I also, uh, the that social community piece was the probably the, it's still the biggest challenge, because I work in government. Like we, uh, <laughs> we are strongly encouraged, or discouraged rather, from uh, having personal and business mixed, because everything that you do in uh, it, at least in Vermont state government is a matter of public record so if you mix your if you have a Facebook community and you're using your work uh, on your personal Facebook now your whole personal Facebook is a is a matter of public record it's a it and you know I mean that's it's not just paranoid thinking it's really you know there's there's a real danger there for folks and you don't want to encourage them to mix uh, you know, personal and business, especially in this environment. So it was extra challenging. And I, you know, honestly, I, I haven't yet met the challenge. I'm still trying to figure out how to do it in this environment where it can be uh, a safe, closed off community, but still also be social without using publicly, freely available tools that are not kind of locked down. It's a, that is a challenge that continues to puzzle me. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think, you know, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have any of our K-12 um, school media librarians here today, but I know that was a big issue for them as well, you know, how, how you're protecting the privacy, of, and certainly, and for academic librarians as well, you know, certainly student, pri student privacy is an issue. So I think, you know, that was one thing that I really enjoyed as all of you were going through is the discussions that we all had about those issues and, and how to, you know, for each of our institutions, how to, how to resolve them. So, but Amanda, were you going to say something? I was just going to say the biggest surprise for me was that um, I didn't have to figure things out in the order that I would have thought. <laughs> Um, so certainly as I went through the process, like I have, I have this name now, I'm calling it Librad, and I knew it needed a name to get it to sort of stick for people. I didn't come up with that until I was, so I think in the social or community module, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but, you know, that's not the place you would expect to find that. But, um, you know, I did my initial instructional design plan and I was worried, the, the name was one thing, marketing was one thing, and the timing, trying to figure out what my timing was going to be, how I was going to deliver this, how much time it would all take. Um, I was very concerned about those things at the beginning, and I was assured, just just do the plan with the the sections that we've got, and the rest will fall into place later. And it and it did. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, I think that's, you know, the fact that we, we do have this kind of seven-step model, but I think, you know, we, we try to make it clear from the beginning, and I think it, it really is brought home that it's not a linear, you know, that you, you, you know, maybe you go through the seven steps in order, but then you go back, and you're, you, you, know, you go back to step two, right. and then you go back to step five, yeah. and then you're, you know, so I think that's, I think, you know, that's one of the most important pieces I think that we all have, have gotten out of this is that, the iterative nature, the fact that you're constantly Definitely. revising and how much that helps. Kathy is saying, smile everyone and I'll take your picture. Oh. I don't know if she's serious <laughs> or... <laughs> well, <free> chat. <laughs> it's also Kathy. Worth, I'll say this is, this is not related to the, the process itself. But the biggest surprise for me was how much fun you can have in a holiday party in a web meeting like this. That's yeah, fun. right? <laughs> we had fun with that. We had so much fun. Yes. That was so and, much fun. And, and Kathy's talking about the fact that now we need to do a summer pool party online. <laughs> yes. so I think for any of you who are considering joining the program, this is perhaps an enticement. You can join in our online video chat pool party, however we're going to manage that. So. Hope I will class. say, <laughs> I will share share this with those who are listening. Um, the Christmas, New Year's time was something I would never forget with the group because we were trying to finish things up and there was people working through and, you know, like we all brought in 2017 together finishing this thing. And <laughs> so it was like, like this was... You know, this is really a bond that we, we now have because I would, you know, I had to go through a, I had to go through a flat tire and and, and miss meetings and it was Come just it was, building. yes, it was definitely that. Like so, I I can say, um, you know, joint like this was a labor of love, but it was with the uh, key word being labor and love, capital L <laughs> in both. Yes. But, you know, but you know, but it was. But I will never forget that whole week of Christmas, New Year's, and just how tight that was, which that whole stress brought us all together. Scott, we all shared a lot trying to practice the whole Adobe Connect sessions. <laughs> yeah. So it was, yeah, so it was definitely a bonding experience, but it was, but it was something that I, um, and just, you know, to my current role now, I've learned, I've just in putting this stuff into practice, you see how beneficial this all has been. And and I really can't stress that enough is that, you know, it was a long year, <laughs> but it was, but it was, <laughs> but it was, it was so, it was so worth it when I'm putting things in practice and, you know, having people come to me for advice. And, and I was like, wow, just, you know, just this time last year, I would have never thought that I would be the voice that people would be, you know, trying to come to, you know, for these things. And now I'm like, you know, wouldn't call myself an expert, but I am definitely, you know, have strong knowledge in these things now. So. Absolutely. It's so great to hear. Yeah, I, you know, I, I feel such a strong bond with this group, and, and I hope, you know, what's really exciting now is now that we're really going public and, you know, on Web Junction, we can bring, we're bringing new people in, that we really want to keep this conversation going, that, you know, many of the alumni have expressed an interest in being part of some of the discussion forums, and, and you know, mainly it looks like we're going to be, have our discussion forum in the Moodle on Web Junction, and then also Facebook seems to be the other kind of social media source for people who do that stuff. Um, but again, the Moodle on Web Junction is a, is a more kind of closed, contained space for people who are not as comfortable with the, the open social media. Um, and the Facebook group is a closed group, I also should say. But, um, you know, but keeping that conversation going with our alums and our new people, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how this, you know, how all of us, how our work is moving forward. So. Yeah. Yeah, and for the yeah. attendees out there, I wanted to say, so if you'd like to hear more about the program and you haven't already, you can register to join us next Tuesday, May 16th at 2 p.m., and that will be the webinar focusing on the diversity module. Well, thank you.
everybody. Yes, I, I see we're, we're past three o'clock here, so thanks so much, everybody, for, for your time. And Yes, thank um, you, guys. If, if anybody did think of other, for attendees out there, if you had other questions that you didn't think of, you can contact us and, you know, we'll follow up after this. And as Jessica said, we, this is just the first of four. Um, so we'll be continuing this conversation next week uh, with a focus on the diversity module. Um, and I promised I would put that slide up again. So here I'll, I'll do my screen sharing again and just to make myself the presenter first. So I'll put that up. Is it still there? Yes, it's still pulsing away there. <laughs> and I'll also, I'll, <laughs> I'll also put, uh, put these links in the chat in case you want to just go to them directly. But great, thank you all so much. And oh, and one thing, Scott, thank you for a screencast omatic because I would not have gotten through the uh, cap capstone project if it wasn't for that because we had some problems with the Adobe and it was just so thank you. <laughs> that was that was a life life saver. <laughs> That's great. Welcome.